Well, good morning. Welcome to One Church. We're so glad that you are here, whether you come every single week or maybe this is your first time here. We are so thankful that you would come spend this hour with us. And our heart is this, is that today that you would not encounter a worship team or a church, but today that you will encounter Jesus. For those of you that don't know, my name is Crystal Sparks. My husband and I are the lead pastors here at One Church. And today I get the honor and the privilege of speaking to you. And hey, I want to let you know about a few things happening here at One Church, and we have an awesome series coming up. Next month starts at the movies. We're so excited about at the movies. At the movies is this, is just us taking modern day stories, which are movies, and turning them into where you can see biblical truths behind them. And this isn't something original that we do. Uh, Jesus was so masterful at taking everyday stories and revealing biblical truths to people through them. And so we are really excited about this series kicking off in November. Watch this video. are so excited for that series. It's going to be incredible. Uh, we have handouts available for you guys, so be sure, invite your friends, invite your family, invite your coworkers, your neighbors, invite everybody, because we're so excited about At The Movie Series. So today, I have the honor and the privilege to, you, to bring this word to you, and we are going to be in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 24, verses 27 and 30 and 31. Let's read this together. It says, put first things first, prepare your work outside and get it ready for yourself in the field. And afterward, build your house and establish a home. I went by the field of a lazy man and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And behold, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles were covering its face, and its stone wall was broken down. I want to talk to you today about servant leadership is our identity. Can I pray with you today as we begin this time together? Uh, Jesus, we just thank you that this is a God-appointed word at a God-appointed time. Father, I just thank you that every heart is softened, that every ear is open for the seed of the word of God. Father, declare in this place that no one will leave the same, that every life will be changed in Jesus' name. And everybody who believed it said, amen, amen. Okay, so throughout this series that we've been in. Oh my goodness, Pastor Brian has done an incredible job. And what he's been doing is talking about our whole series of Welcome Home. For those of you that don't know, every year we put out a new declaration, a declaration that we believe comes from God's heart. And we spend time praying and asking the Lord, why, what does he want to say to his people for this year? And Brian and I both felt like in our hearts that God was saying, Welcome Home. And so over the last few weeks, we've been talking about the things that we value as a church. And the reason for that is, is I believe this, whatever you value will determine what you focus on, treasure, and will set the direction for your life. So here's the thing is I can see what you value by where you spend your time. I can see what you value by where you spend your treasure. In other words, if I look at your bank statement, I can see the things that are important to you. But here's the most important part is what we value will determine the direction for our life. You know, just as when you come into somebody's house, everybody's house is different. 
and everybody has different unsaid rules, if you will. Like we have rules in our house that whenever people come over during the Christmas time, uh, we make gingerbread houses and we have them out on the kitchen counter and all of our family, we each make a different gingerbread house. Well, one time my uh, nephew came over and he was there having a great time. Well, he saw gingerbread houses and to him, he saw it as a snack. So he started eating the jelly beans off of the gingerbread house and my son was so distraught to which he told his cousin he said you are eating our memories <laughs> and and to Ian at his house gingerbread houses are to be eaten at our house they're like memories they're like memorials of that year's Christmas and they don't get thrown away till almost Valentine's Day because I'm like convincing the kids like we cannot hold on to this any longer but every house has different things that they value every house has different things that they uh, unsaid rules if you will and so during this series what we've been talking about is the things that we value at one church because we know this that what we value will determine the direction of this church so the first thing that we talked about as a church family is we talked about Jesus is our message oh my goodness that was such a great word if you missed it you want to be sure go back on the podcast and listen to it the second thing that we talked about was people are heart the third message last week uh, Pastor Ryan did such a great job talking about generosity is our privilege we don't have to give we get to give and then today we are talking about servant leadership is our identity you know recently I made the mistake of inviting a ton of people over my house and I don't know if you guys do this but whenever I have people over to my house it makes me do all the things that we've been meaning to do for a long time like all in just a short amount of time and it starts out being like hey guys like just come over we'll just have some sandwiches we'll just chill out like it'll be no big deal to the next thing I know like we're cleaning out flower beds Brian's scooping out the pool like we're buying new furniture we end up buying steaks from Costco like it goes over the top right and so the other day we were getting ready for people to come over to our house and Oh my goodness, like it just turned into this really big ordeal. And in that process, I was like almost resenting the people before they got there because I'm sweeping the floor, I'm vacuuming, I'm trying to make it look like people don't live there. When you have two children, that's really hard to do. And so I was doing all this. Well, then their cars drove up and I'm there at the door and I'm smiling and I'm trying to make it look like I wasn't up all night making these cookies that I had no idea how to make. And I'm like, praise the Lord, amen. I'm so glad you're here. And you know, whenever people People come over, you have doors that you just don't let them open because that's what's hiding everything that you just shoved in the closet. And so they're there and we're, you know, I'm serving their food and acting like, oh no, it's no big deal. Like these are just little steaks that we just picked up the other day at Costco. It's no big deal. Oh, that chair, like we've had it for years, no big deal. And so the night goes on and at the end of the night, they're staying forever and I'm tired and they're not tired. They're just still there having fun. And the night gets over and we greet them and say goodbye and Brian and I look at each other and now we have to clean it all up. Now there's dishes to do and the floor needs to be swept again and the carpet needs to be vacuumed again. And I'm like, oh my goodness. And the next day I wake up and there's still things that I'm finding that their children left behind. Can I get a witness in this place? And so after all that, I began thinking about with the declaration of us saying welcome home, I began to think about what does that mean for us as a church? And I began to think about how the same way when I had people over to my house, there was never any question who was going to cook the food. There was never any question who was going to prepare the table. There was never any question who was going to scoop out the pool or clean the flower bed or make sure all the furniture looked great. There was never any question who was going to greet them at the front door, who was going to make their place, who was going to stay late when everybody else was gone from having a good time and who was going to clean up. I knew with the invitation, I accepted the responsibility of what was ahead. And I'll say this here at One Church, when we made the declaration of welcome home, we are saying every person that comes in here, I am responsible. I am responsible to make sure that you feel loved, that you feel welcome, that you feel accepted. In our declaration of welcome home, it's not just a cute t-shirt or a worship guide that we hand you at the front door. It's saying, I'm the one who's willing to be there when nobody else is. I'm the one that's going to stay when everybody else is gone because it's really not about me it's about you came into our house and with welcome home I'm going to make sure that you have everything you need to feel as welcome as possible can I get a witness in this place come on bump somebody around you and say welcome home welcome home 
I love this scripture I'm going to share with you in Isaiah, and I think you're going to really enjoy it. Isaiah 54, verse 2, I want us to read this together. Enlarge the place of your tent. And let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Spare not. Somebody say spare not. Spare not. not. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. Oh, my goodness. God is speaking here to his people. And he's letting them know, guys, I'm about to do something so big, so great. You're about to see so many people come in that the space that you have right now, it's not big enough. And so I'm going to need you to lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. And I love what he says there. Spare not. You know, he goes on, if you continue to read through Isaiah, and the Lord is a God of detail. And he begins to tell them exactly how much bigger it was to be. And what I think is interesting is at that time, they didn't have fancy things to be able to measure the tent. They didn't have uh, things that we have today. So they measured in what they called cubits. And cubits is literally this. It's a hand width. And so each hand, each cubit stood for one hand. And what I thought I think is interesting is in the Lord saying to lengthen their cords and to strengthen their stakes, he's saying it's going to take more hands getting involved to be able to take in what we're about to do. I want to let you know here at One Church, since September, we have seen 150 salvations. Come on, can we just give it up for every person? That's since September 1st, we've seen 150 people come into the kingdom. And you know what I feel like the Spirit of the Lord is saying? It's time for us to lengthen our cords and to strengthen our stakes. In other words, this isn't the time to spare. This isn't the time to cut corners. But here's the thing is it's going to take more hands getting involved to begin to do all that God has called us to do. In the same way it was in the Old Testament, God's still doing the same today. Because I'll say this, with 150 new believers, that means we need more people greeted at the front door. We need more children being taught the Word of God. We need more groups happening coming up in this spring semester. We need more people that say, I have two hands. I have two feet. I'm not going to spare my time. I'm not going to spare what I have, but I'm going to use everything I have for the kingdom of God to advance. See, what's interesting is, is everything that God says is a positively, a possibility, not a positively. See, he was letting the people know, I'm about to enlarge things, but it's how many hands you get involved will determine how great the harvest is. It's how many people are willing to say, you know what, I'll I'll lend a hand. I'll I'll put my hand in. If it means somebody else can come in and hear the message, I'll put my hand into what God is doing. The word field here in our opening scripture that we read in Proverbs, we see that two men got a field. And I I was so interested in this because I think that uh, God is just so good. And, and I want to tell you that he's an equal field giver. Like you have a field and you might not have a literal field, but in the kingdom and in, in God, you have a field. And the word field there has three different meanings. Uh, the first one is it's a place of battle. When I began to look it into it, that word field meant that it was a place of battle. It was a place for the fight. I want to tell you that Ephesians 6, 12 tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. And every attack that has happened on your life, it's not about the stuff. It's not about the things. Husbands and wives, let me just tell you that it's really not about the fight you had last night. It's not about the fight that you got into this morning. Everything that's happening in your life, the battle is always over the field because the enemy knows if he can get you out of the field, he can keep your house from being built. So here's the thing, is I want you to see the second thing is that it's also a place for sports, a place for sports. And and what that means, it's a place of discipline. It's a place of discipline. You know, I think it's interesting. I saw an interview with athletes, and they were asked, you know, about them winning a gold medal. And the one thing I think that's interesting is um, I, I heard them say this, that if I were to ask my feelings how I felt about my discipline of training for the gold medal, I wouldn't have ever won a gold medal. Because it wasn't about what my feelings said. I was committed to the discipline of the training. 
And I want to tell you that when we begin to issue out the decree of welcome home, when I was there sweeping my floors and, and vacuuming, getting ready for the guests, it wasn't about what my feelings said. It was about the discipline of following through with what I said I would do that made me follow through in that moment. And the same is true in this house, that God is calling us to a field that's going to take, yes, it's going to take the battle. It's going to take the fight. But it's also going to take us to have a place of discipline that says, I'm not going to take lightly what God has given to me. I'm going to understand this, that the people hearing the message is directly correlated to my acts of obedience every single day. Come on, somebody. The third thing that uh, you'll see here is a place for farming, a place for farming. And what I think is interesting in this is it's a place of patience. See, farming is not exciting. I will just tell you, I live in the country, and there's copious amounts of land all around us. And I've never seen a farmer out there just having tons of people out there having a great time, so much fun, like plowing this field. Like, this is awesome. No, it's a place of patience. You know, it's just like what Pastor Brian said last week. Nobody sows a seed, and then the next day gets frustrated that there's not a harvest there. It takes time for it. And here it is, these, these people, what God is trying to let them know is both people got a field. But what grew in their field was directly determined on how well were they willing to do the battle. How well were they disciplined? And how patient were they in the process? See, Jesus was so good at ministering to the crowds. He had tons of people who were coming around him, and they were surrounding him on every single side. But the minute he started to call them to things of discipline, come on, to the things of patience, to the things of battle, they tapped out fast. But what's interesting is the difference between the disciples and the followers of Jesus were the ones who were there in the battle, the ones who were there in the times of patience, and the ones who were there willing to be disciplined in the process. And those three, those 12, they saw more of Jesus than the thousands ever saw. They were there on the Mount of Transfiguration. They were there in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was crying until blood came forth. They got to see things that no one else saw. And church, let me just tell you, will you see a measure of Jesus by just coming on a Sunday morning? Yes. Like you'll see a measure of Jesus, but you'll never see the things that some of our dream team have seen. You'll never see the things that some of our group leaders have seen. Come on, somebody. I want to live a life where I say, God, whatever field you've given me, let me just be in a place where I'm willing to do the battle. I'm patient in the process and I'm faithful in being disciplined. The next thing I want to sh- talk to you about as we turn our page here, isn't God so good? In 2 Timothy, Paul is writing to Timothy, and he's writing him encouragement. And what I think is so amazing about God is that nothing is by accident. And Paul, in trying to encourage Timothy, he tells him, I want you to have the discipline, the, the, the faithfulness in the battle like a soldier. I want you to have the discipline of the athlete, and I want you to have the patience of the farmer. In other words, God is pointing back by inspiration of the Holy Spirit through Paul, and he's saying, point him back to Proverbs 24 and let him know that he is in his field right now. And friend, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what things are happening in your life, but I can say this with total confidence, that everything that's happening in your life, is it's got one purpose, and that's to get you out of your field. It's to get you out of the place that God has planted you. So a few things I want us to declare as as we're moving forward. And if you're taking notes in your uh, One Church app, you can follow along as we're filling in the blanks here together. Uh, The first thing is, I want you to write this down. I am responsible. I am responsible. I, my kids are really awesome, and I love them so much. And especially when they were littler, they used to do this thing when something bad would happen. I would say, I would come into the room, and I'd see a mess, and I'd ask them, okay, who's responsible for this? And that's where the name game would happen. It was his fault. It was her fault. It was somebody else's fault. Come on, somebody. Um, one time, Braley even blamed the goldfish, right? Like it, was like, it was always somebody else's fault. But a sign of maturity happened when they began to say, I am responsible. 
See, the difference between the people who are immature in Christ and the people who are mature in Christ are the people who are willing to say, I am responsible. And here in this house with the issue of welcome home, what we're saying is I am responsible for how welcomed you feel. I am responsible for every child, whether they know the gospel message or not. I am responsible for whether or not cars get greeted out in the parking lot. I am responsible whether or not the production is going flawlessly. I am responsible. I'm not waiting for somebody else. I'm not looking at somebody else. And I'll just say this, that if you ever have the attitude of it's not my job, then you've stopped being a servant leader. Because here's the thing, is that for us to do all that God has called us to do, it's going to take a body of people that says, I am responsible. And here we see, I love this, and Isaiah 54 is letting them know that the harvest that God's about to bring in is as big as you make it. And I'll tell you that this church will grow to the measure of people who say, I am responsible. I'm not waiting for somebody else to do it. I'm not waiting for somebody else to step up. If If there's a child that needs to be reached, I will reach them. If there's a person that needs to be greeted, I will greet them. I'm not waiting. I'm not asking my feelings because here's the thing. It's an hour and a half of my week. God has done so much for me. How can I not do something back for him? Somebody say it with me. Say, I am responsible. In Luke chapter 10, verse 2, oh my goodness, this is so good. In the Passion Translation, it says the harvest is huge and ripe but there are not enough harvesters to bring it all in. As you go, plead with the owner of the harvest to drive out into the harvest fields many more workers. I wanna tell you that the harvest is huge in Sulphur Springs. The harvest is huge in Roy City. The harvest, the harvest is huge in Greenville. In fact, just the other day, uh, my kids go to Terrell schools and I had a lady at the administration office and she looked at me and she said, oh, you and your husband are the pastors at one church. I said, yeah, we are. And she goes, oh my goodness, like I love what God is doing at your church. And I was like, oh my goodness, like yes, God's been so faithful. And she asked me this question and it's been burning in my head. And she said this, when are we going to have a one church tarot? And all of a sudden I realized we don't have a harvest problem. The harvest is sure. People are waiting. I want to just issue this decree. There's cities waiting for another church. There's people waiting for another invite. There's children waiting to be taught. And here's the thing is they are waiting for a people who will resound. I am responsible. We're going to go and we're going to reach the people wherever God sends us. See here, Jesus is letting them know we don't have a harvest problem. We have a laborer problem. But if ever the laborers get in the field, then all of a sudden we'll begin to collect people into the kingdom of God, I want to tell you today that God's vision for this church is so great, but it's directly connected with your willingness to say, I am responsible. The next thing I want you to know is to know your field, to know your field. Brian and I, we uh, bought a beautiful place and we love it. We have uh, just shy of seven acres or eight acres. I don't know. We have a good parcel of land. There's a whole portion we never even see. Um, And it was funny because when we first moved in, we were just, it was like just so good. Like I was raised a girl in the ghetto and um, I didn't have anything growing up. My mom would not eat at dinner to make sure my brother and my sister and I would be able to eat. Like, I was raised with nothing. And so when we moved into our house, like all I could say every single morning was just, thank you, Jesus. Like, this is my house. Like, I can't believe we live here. And weeks had gone on and Brian had mowed the yard. And I'm just out there looking like, wow, God, you are just so good. And in that, Brian's so friendly and he always meets all of our neighbors. It's so annoying. (laughs) He like makes friends with everybody. And uh, so he truly is people are our heart. And I'm like, hey, I'm that garage door person like closing the garage door and he's out there like making friends inviting them over for dinner um so he was meeting our neighbors and he's like hey if you know who owns that back portion um back behind our land there's like a lot and he said if you'll let me know who owns that one day I I might be interested in buying it well he had thrown it out there to a few people and finally he told one man who was our neighbor and he said hey if you find out who owns that back lot just let me know I might be interested in buying it And the man goes, which one? He said, the one right behind our land. He goes, Brian, that's your land. 
And Brian goes, my land? And he goes, yeah, you own all the way back to that fence. He goes, you got to be kidding me. And he, and he said, I've been wondering why we couldn't find our surveyor stakes. Like, I thought the guy just was, like, taking a smoke break, and he didn't put out the right amount of flags, right? And so we got out there, and we're looking at our land, and we're like, oh, my goodness. And Brian said something to the neighbor that I'll never forget, and this is wrong in my spirit. He said, I would have taken so much better care of it if I would have known it was mine. And I think when we get to heaven, God is going to show us people that weren't reached, that didn't hear the message. And our response is going to be, I would have taken so much better care of them if I would have known that they were mine. If I would have known they were in my field. If I would have known that that child was lonely, I would have loved them. I, if I would have just realized the importance of showing up and ushering. If I would have realized the importance of how much a hug could give as a greeter. I would have done so much more if I would have realized. And Brian immediately hops on his lawnmower and he's out there just happy as a clam mowing his back land. And, Everything goes on. And, and I begin to think about how we disconnect with the field that we're in. And we don't know the field that we're in. Now, listen, I know some of you are here for the first time, and I'm not trying to hard sell you at all. Like, please, hear my heart. Like, this is, this is a family message. You can be inspired. Come back next week. Pastor Brian, I have a great word for you. <laughs> um, but this is for the people who call one church their home. And I want to tell you, know your field. If this is your church, if this is your home, know your field. Know your field. Well, I don't feel like anybody knows me. How well do you know them? When's the last time you invited somebody over for dinner? When's the last time you reached out and made yourself friendly? One of my favorite people on our serve team, his name is Lynn Fredericks, and I love what he says. He says, every time I come to one church, he said, I make it a challenge to meet 25 new people. And he said, I just make it a challenge. I'm going to get 25 hugs. I'm going to say 25 hellos, 25 high fives. And he said, I started doing that. And he said, you know what? Now every week when I come in, he goes, I get over 25. He's like, I get like 100 high fives. I get like 100 hugs. And it interesting when he came in with a servant leadership heart how the harvest he got back was so much more than what he came for and I want to tell you the same is true for you that there's people sitting on your row that want to be your friend there's people in this church waiting in a community group to pray with you for that difficulty that you've been going through. There's people in our parking lot team that would love to link arms with you and believe God for that promotion. But when your heart begins to declare that I am responsible and servant leadership is our identity, then you begin to partner with the vision. You know your field and you begin to get in there with the other people who are in the field as well. The third thing I want to tell you is to stay in your field. See, it's not enough to just know your field. It's not enough to say, I am responsible, but you got to stay in your field. Let's read the scripture together in Psalm 92, verse 13. You're going to love this. It says, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Isn't that so good? Let's read that again. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. The only way to flourish is to be planted. You will not flourish if you're not planted. Whenever we read our beginning scripture, I think it's so interesting because here we see two men that both have houses. I mean, both have fields. But, but the one thing I think is interesting, if we could just, if my sound people can just put the scripture, the opening scripture, Proverbs 24, up on the screen, the first scripture, it says, put first things first, prepare your work outside and get it ready for yourselves in the field. And afterward, build your house and establish a home. Next verse. And it says, but I went by the field of a lazy man and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And behold, it was all grown over with thorns next verse and covering its face and its stone wall was broken down so here we see two men that have fields but only one has a house the one who has the house is the one who first spent time in the field and here's the thing I want you to see is that everything that happens in your life is to get you out of the field because the devil knows if he can get you out of the field he can attack your house and your life is growing something. And it's either growing something beautiful or something toxic. Because the man, the lazy man, it says, that wasn't in the field, his, his whole field was covered in nettles and thorn bushes. And it says, and his stone wall was covered in them. What's interesting is when you look at that original word field, it was a place wide open with no walls to keep people out. And the lazy man 
built a wall with his neglect, and it kept people out of the field. I want to tell you, and this is, this is going to be strong, but I want you just to hear it by the Spirit of God. Every time that I serve, my house is being built, and I'm making sure that a wall, a fence, isn't there to keep people from coming in. And every time I sit back on my, my elbows and I say, no, you know, it's somebody else's job. It's somebody else's responsibility. Somebody else can serve. Somebody else can do that. I'm building a wall that's keeping people out. And I believe that God's called us as a church. If you want your house built, you got to stay in the field. It says that those who are planted, they will flourish. My oak tree in my backyard doesn't get offended. My oak tree in my backyard doesn't go, oh, the sparks moved in here. I'm out. Sorry. Like, I've been here for like 50 years, but, you know, it's been a good run. I'll see you later. No, every tree when we moved in is still in our backyard. We, we made 100%, y'all. <laughs> well, not every tree. We had some cut down. <laughs> That's another story. Anyways, but what I'm saying in that is this, is that maybe this is your fifth church. Maybe this is your 10th church. And you're wondering why your life isn't flourishing. Can I challenge you? To get planted, to get planted even when things are hard, even when things are difficult, even when the battle is going on and there's discipline issues that you're having to deal with and, oh, I didn't like the way they responded to me. But when I decide to stay planted and I stay in the field, the Bible says that my house will be built. And I know this, that when I'm in the field and I'm taking care of God's house, God's making sure that my house is taken care of as well. Friend, I don't know how you came in here today. I don't know what's happening in your life, but I want to tell you here today at One Church, servant leadership is our identity, and in that, we're not just hoping things are going to get better. Every Sunday, we're serving to make things better in our community, make things better in our world, make things better in our families, and as we do that, we're seeing God do some amazing things. I want to pray with you today as we close our time together. If you could just put your hands open right where you're at. And I want us just to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to us? God, how are you calling us into the field? Some of you here in this place, life got so busy. You got so busy and you got so distracted. And, and there was a time that you were in the field. You were faithful in the field. You were there all the time. And then things started picking up. The business started picking up. The kid life started picking up. Everything started to get crazy. And, and somewhere you got out of the field. And now it feels like everything in your world is chaos. And friend, that's okay. I just, I want to tell you today, God's calling you to get back in the field. Lord, I just declare in this place that we have two hands. We have two feet. We have a voice, and God, we just commit them to you here at One Church. Lord, we declare we're not waiting for somebody else to do it, that God, here at One Church, God, we're lengthening our cords. We're strengthening our stakes. We see that the harvest is sure. And so, God, right now, we just declare over every heart and every person that we say yes to what you have for us, yes to your will, yes to your way. And, God, we declare that as we begin to say yes, God, many people are going to say yes to the kingdom. So, Father, here in this place, Lord, we say that we're ready and we're willing for whatever you might have for us. Jesus, we commit our hearts to you. In Jesus' name, and everybody say amen, amen. Well, if you're hearing the sound of my voice, friend, let me tell you, the greatest thing that I ever did was giving Jesus Christ my heart, giving him my life. And, and I'm not talking about a list of do's and don'ts. I'm not talking about um, church attendance. I'm not talking about any of those things. I'm talking about a relationship with him. I remember I was 17 years old, and I came into a church service kind of like what you're in right now. And I heard the gospel message preached, and for the first time, God just gripped my heart, and I knew I wanted a relationship with him. And it was there in that service, I raised my hand, and it felt like a simple prayer, and honestly, I went home, and nothing about me changed. Like, I looked the same, I still had the same passion, same desires, but little by little, God began to change me. And friend, today, I want to tell you that God's calling you into relationship with him. 
He wants so badly, not just to, for him to be a place that you visit occasionally, but for him to be your Lord and your Savior. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to pray with you today. If you're ready to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, will you just lift your hand on the count of three? Maybe you used to serve God, but it's been a little while. You've made some mistakes and you've fallen away. Today's a great day to give your life back to him. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to pray with you right where you're at. Will you lift your hand on the count of three? One, two, three. Lift your hand. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray this together as a church family. Lord Jesus, I give you my heart. I give you my life. Take my sins. And by your grace, I take your righteousness. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Come on, give up a big hand clap for every person who just prayed that prayer. Amen. We're so thankful that you prayed that. Hey, I wanted you to take a second. We want to celebrate with you. Can you take a moment and text the keyword decided to 33733. That's decided to 33733. Follow the prompts. And we want to make sure that you have everything you need as you begin this faith journey.